When Fridays were in high school, they won a senior superlative for most likely to be awesome. I'm Carl Azus for CNN 10. Thank you for spending part of your Friday with us. School is actually the first subject we have for you today. When is it going to reopen? It's a simple question with complicated answers across the United States. There are so many different plans in different places and they could all change. Even though at least 31 states say they'll partially reopen over the next few days, this doesn't include their schools. Most school buildings in America have been shut down for the rest of the 2019-2020 academic year. Classes may still be in session, they're just online. In some states with fewer coronavirus cases, places like Montana and Wyoming, schools will be allowed to reopen this month, but they may choose to stay closed to help prevent the spread of the disease. And what will school look like this fall? Can students and teachers expect a more normal looking campus then? It'll most likely depend on how widespread COVID-19 is in different areas. The governments of Maryland and Washington, which have each seen thousands of coronavirus cases, have told school districts it's possible their doors won't reopen in the fall and that they should be prepared for online learning beyond this summer. But contrast that with colleges in Alabama, North Carolina, North Dakota, and Texas. Dozens of campuses across these states say they're gearing up for the return of students and teachers this fall. Things may not look the same though. School officials across the country are trying to figure out ways to keep students spread out and classrooms from getting too crowded. Masks may be required on some campuses. Officials plan to keep closer tabs on who's been infected with coronavirus and where those people went before they got sick. And sports events bring up new questions entirely. Will football games still be played in front of 80,000 screaming fans? So even as some businesses start to reopen across America, there's still a lot of uncertainty hanging over the country's schools. We haven't heard anything about what schools are really going to look like. Um, all summer classes are online and that's pretty much the extent of what we know. The university I'm attending hasn't really said much about reopening. I was most looking forward to hanging out in the dorm and, uh, and all the shared spaces. And unfortunately, I don't think that'll be a possibility. Harvard will be open for the fall semester, but some or all classes may be online. Harvard's provost says by the fall, the school cannot be certain that it will be safe to resume all usual activities on campus. The head of Purdue University is more optimistic. He told ABC News the school is working on plans to reopen Purdue's campus this fall. Our students in overwhelming numbers are saying they want to be here. We uh, think we can do it, but uh, we don't pretend to have all the answers. We're working on them very hard right now. Some of the measures Daniels is proposing spreading out classes across days and times to reduce their size, pre-testing students and staff for infection, tracing contacts for those who test positive and asking contacts to self-quarantine for 14 days. The president of Brown University says reopening college campuses this fall should be a national priority. What we're doing is making a plan. We don't know if we're gonna be able to implement it. It depends on how the pandemic spreads to just apply very basic public health principles as we think about reopening the campus and bringing students back. Still, some students may decide not to return to school this year, regardless of whether their campus reopens. The American Council on Education predicts enrollment nationwide will drop 15%, costing institutions $23 billion in revenue. It's testing, it's tracing, and it's separating or quarantining and isolating people who are sick or who might have been exposed. 10 second trivia. An aircraft's primary control system includes what? Stick, rudder, and throttle, pilot and autopilot, aileron's elevator and rudder, or elevator and wing flaps. According to the US Federal Aviation Administration, a plane's primary controls include aileron's elevator and rudder. And aircraft have gotten a lot more complicated and computerized since these were the only planes in the sky. The World War I fighters we showed you a couple weeks ago. The ailerons, elevator, rudder, and throttle were pretty much the only things you could control on these aircraft. In our ongoing partnership with CNN Travel, we've taken you to a number of fascinating places around the world, virtually at least. Today, we're taking you inside one of the modern passenger planes that can get you there. My name is Gerhard Ramke. I'm chief pilot at Abaltic. 
We're currently on an Airbus 220 in the 300 version, so the longer version of the Airbus 220. The aircraft takes about 150 passengers. We fly at an altitude of 41,000 feet and we've got a range of more than 3,500 nautical miles. So the flight deck itself is state of the art. It's a full glass cockpit, no round dial instruments anymore. All of the data is projected onto these screens. So available for our routing and for the performance of the aircraft is the, the FMS, the flight management system. The flight management system feeds the aircraft um, with the data where to go and how to do all of that when it comes to engine performance and so forth. So we've got a cursor wandering around on the screens. I've got different pages where I can implement the data and this will then feed the autopilot in towards what it needs to do at certain stages of the flight. You've got side stick technology, so we don't have any yoke taking away the view anymore from our instruments. It's got movable rotor throttles, which means that the throttles give the feedback on the current power setting. The pedals down here are to move the rudder, and on the ground you could move the nose wheel to steer it. This panel up here operates all of the systems. It's basically meant to be set before the flight. Actually, it's designed to have a dark cockpit, so there should be no lights on. And if you don't have any non-normals, then there should be no necessity really to switch anything in flight. If we would go for a takeoff now, we would have made sure that all of the panels are set accordingly. Then we would have set up FMS. Then we would have our maps uh, set accordingly here and just in front of us. I've got an airport moving map here so that I can see exactly where to taxi. On the takeoff run itself, we would put the power into a certain position, check that the engine values are stable, and then the order throttle system would be taking over from there. Then with my side stick at a certain speed, I would rotate the aircraft into a certain pitch value and then continue the takeoff. And at some point, although I'd love to do the entire flight manually, I would switch the autopilot on. Our last report today is about perseverance and ingenuity. Perseverance is the name of NASA's Mars 2020 rover that's scheduled to launch this summer. And ingenuity is the name of the drone helicopter it'll be carrying. It's about two and a half feet tall, it weighs four pounds, it costs $23 million to develop, and it won't be carrying any scientific instruments. Ingenuity is mainly going along to demonstrate the technology. And while scientists built it, an Alabama high school student named it. It was like a stroke of ingeniousness. Hey, helicopter naming takes a true fan. There's nothing they'd rotor be doing. They're not afraid to give it a whirl, take it for a spin, make their pitch, rock and roll, because hey, when it comes to naming aircraft, sky's the limit. We're reaching new heights today. Columbia Heights High School is in Columbia Heights, Minnesota. Great to have you watching, even if my puns crash and burn. I'm Carl Azus for CNN.